Hi everyone. So we're going to start a new topic this week. We'll talk about common pool resources and energy conservation. So this is the outline of this week's talk. We'll first review what common pool resources are and then um, go through different ways of nudging energy conservation. Then we'll talk about a study that overcomes um, salience bias. We'll discuss a little bit about what salience bias is before we go into the details of the study. So what are common pool resources? Um, in week one, we divided uh, the goods that we consume into roughly four different boxes. Um, and so the division or the classification were based on two dimensions. One is whether the consumption of the goods is rival. So rivalness is defined as whether my consumption precludes other people from consuming the same good. And the second dimension is whether the consumption is excludable. In other words, whether the designer can exclude some users from consuming the good. And so if a good is both excludable and rival, then we call them private goods. So the stuff that we consume in everyday life in, um, for instance, broccoli, uh, breakfast cereal, these are all private goods. Um, what we're going to talk about today is common pool resources. These goods are rival, but they're not excludable or difficult to exclude. So let's take a look at the characteristics of common pool resources. So the first dimension is that they're highly rivalrous. The second one is that, you know, the ability to exclude others from consumption is low. In fact, a lot of the uh, environmental and natural resources belong to this category of common pool resources. So the commons, or fishery, or water, or forests are all uh, common pool resources. The problems with common pool resources is that individual efforts to secure more benefits from the resource have the effect of reducing the benefits received by others. So there's a very well-known book called The Tragedy of the Commons. Um, in the old days when farmers sent their cattle to the commons to graze, Oftentimes, they overgraze and deplete the commons. Um, in fisheries, oftentimes, um, fishermen overfish. And, um, and there are many such problems, such as, you know, depleting the aquifer so that uh, the community uh, are depleted of water. So these are all uh, some of the problems with common pool resources. And so what we're going to do now is to look at whether we can use data uh, to nudge people's energy conservation behavior. So I'm going to cover two studies first. And both of these studies are um, co-authored by Paul Ferraro and Michael Price. And the idea is to use non-pecuniary strategies to influence behavior. Policymakers often rely on non-pecuniary measures um, to manage water supplies. So the traditional strategy has been price-based interventions. So for economists in particular, uh, one can think about a downward sloping supply, uh, demand curve. If you, if you pump up the price, then you reduce the demand for water. Um, now we're going to look at an alternative strategy, which is something that doesn't rely on money, Instead, it relies on nudges. So all through the United States and many different parts of the world, there's a growing concern about the availability of fresh water. And um, the United Nations Environmental Program estimates that over two thirds of the world's population will reside in water stressed areas uh, by 2025. And when you look at the price mechanism or monetary incentives, it actually have been shown to be of limited use in inducing conservation. Because sometimes demand is highly inelastic, meaning when you move the price, you cannot move the demand by a lot. Um, the other issue with the price mechanism is that high user groups tend to be wealthier and less sensitive to prices. So this uh, study or this sequence of studies use non-pecuniary strategies um, to, to see whether we can curb consumption and 
to better manage water supplies. So the overall aims of the study is to examine the effectiveness of non-pecuniary-based strategies as means to manage residential water demand. They, have, they conducted two studies. One, the first one is conducted in Cobb County, Georgia. Um, in this study, the authors compared the relative efficacy of norm-based messages and social comparisons on overall consumption levels. So let's take a look at the uh, first study, which was conducted in Cobb County, Georgia, and that's part of the metro Atlanta area. So here's some background information. Um, the researchers collaborated with Cobb County Water Systems, or C CCWS, uh, to distribute treated surface water to um, approximately 170,000 customers. Um, this is the second largest user, this group of users. They're, they're the second largest user of public water supply in the state. Um, the other empirical regularity is that re residential use is highly variable. About 5% of the customers account for approximately 18% of overall use. So CCWS obtains water from disputed surface supplies affected by periodic drought conditions since 1998. So that prompted initiative to encourage conservation effort among residential consumers. So they've in implemented tiered rate pricing systems. They've also started and uh, conducted several information campaigns to highlight how and why to conserve water. But because they didn't conduct randomized controlled trials or field experiments, it's difficult to look at, to examine, or evaluate the effectiveness of different strategies. So in this study, the authors use um, norm-based messages and social comparisons. Uh, remember, in the first week, we looked at social comparisons uh, in reducing traffic accidents. So there's a growing body of work in economics and psychology that examine such strategies in the context of charitable giving. And these studies focus on decisions of individuals along the intensive margin, and they often compare willingness to pay versus willingness to accept disparities. Um, social psychology literature also examine the use of norm-based strategies to promote environmental conservation they typically have uh, small samples with individuals who are self-selected into the experiment. So in other words, they recruit volunteers. Um, the other part is that social psychology studies often rely on self-reported measure of behavioral change, which tend to be not as accurate as um, the actual behavioral measures or, obje or objective measures. So what the authors have done is to use a natural field experiment. Remember in um, 631 experiment design and analysis, we went through a paper by Harrison and List who uh, gave us different categorizations of um, experiments from lab experiments to field experiments. So natural field experiments are characterized by the fact that the households or the participants are unaware that they're part of an experiment. Um, the other very convenient um, analysis tool is that the randomization serves as an instrument that permits us to evaluate the treatment effects relative to a control condition. It also provides conservative tests of ability to harness pro-social preferences to achieve policy goals. So the, uh, this study considers individual with utility defined over two terms. One is consumption utility. The other one is a morality term that captures non-pecuniary effects of consumption decisions. Both terms are defined over an action, which is consumption of water in this context. And the morality term is influenced by a number of potential factors. For instance, the costs and benefits that the action imposes on others the extent to which action is observed or scrutinized by others, and the set of norms that dictates the acceptability of the actions. So more concretely, we can use a utility function uh, to capture these different motivations. 
So the utility function indexed by lowercase i for consumer i um, is um, a function of a, the action. In this particular case, is water consumption. And n is um, the norm. Theta is a vector of individual specific characteristics. So if you take a look at n, um, n has two components. One is consumption, right? Consumption depends on a, how much water you consume, and theta captures all the other individual specific factors. Minus uh, m term, so mi, which is the morality term which is also defined over A, your action, your water consumption, N, which is um, the extent to which the action deviates from the perceived social norm, so that's N is short for norm, um, S and theta. So what the policymaker could do is to influence water consumption through strategies that target the realization of S and N. So for example, uh, EPA's WaterSense campaign requests users to make every drop count and save water to protect the environment. So they frame conservation as a social norm. Um, if you increase the realization of N and um, the associated increase in disutility from um, deviation from that social norm would pump up the M term. In other words, there, it will give you essentially a, a, you know, an increase in marginal cost from deviating from the social norm. Uh, let's take a look and see how they designed the experiment. So the uh, Cobb County Water System initiated a male-based conservation education program in the summer of 2007, and they partnered with the researchers. They have 107,000 households randomly assigned to either the control group or one of the three treatment, treatment groups. In 631, we talked about different types of random assignment. One of them um, is blocked random assignment or sometimes called stratified random assignment. So this experiment uses stratified random assignment. And also remember um, that stratification or blocking increases statistical power. So this is a very good design feature. So the assignment was, the random assignment was stratified by meter routes. And that ensures that there's no systematic difference across treatments in the timing of the meter readings. And it also increases the precision of estimates. Um, and the, the idea is um, that that's the same as saying that it increases statistical power by increasing the, the precision of the estimates. So here are the different experimental conditions. So there is a technical advice letter, so you can think of that as delivering the um, information. So it's a two-sided tip sheet listing the most effective ways to reduce water use. And the letters were personalized and sent to households in the official CCWS envelopes. Then there are two norms conditions. One is called the social norm. In the norms literature, it's also called the injunctive norm. This is basically what you should do. So the authors label this as the weak norm treatment. Um, so it augments treatment one, which is the technical advice letter, by including personally addressed letters that include norm-based appeal. So it says, you know, specifically, we all need to work together to use water wisely. Please do not waste water. Remember, every job counts. So in other words, it's an exhortation of what you should do. But they have another condition, which is um, a descriptive norm or, you know, social norm through social comparisons. So it augments the norm-based letter to include the comparison of their households with others in the county by saying your neighbor's median consumption is blah. And so the comparison is framed in a negative way in the sense that you consumed more, more than X percent of your neighbors. Remember, in this context, consuming more water is not good. Um, it's not environmentally friendly. So here are the experimental results. We'll first look at the summary statistics. 
um, what you see uh, are the four experimental conditions, the control group, and three different treatment groups. So we have the uh, summer 07 usage uh, in thousands of gallons. And the last column gives us the percentage change relative to summer 06. So one question is, why do they need a control group? Um, the control group is there, remember, to control for time trends. So for instance, if um, summer 06 just happened to be a very dry year, you would have a high baseline where everybody's using a lot of water. Um, so the control group helps um, help us control all the idiosyncratic changes not captured by the treatment. And then we have these three different treatment groups. So this table gives us uh, the average treatment effects, where uh, we look at the linear regression models. And what you see here is um, the constant, as well as a dummy variable or an indicator variable for each of the treatments. You also have the usage, the water use from um, May to October 2006, and also water use from April and May 2007. So what you see here is um, that the dummy, the indicator variables for the three treatments, each of them captures the treatment effect of that treatment compared to the control condition. The difference across the three models are whether you control for route fix effects. So model B controls for the route fix effects. And there's also um, a, a line which says trimming rule, which is whether you exclude the outliers. And this is something that we also see in the traffic experiment, which is sometimes their outliers um, might completely skew your, um, your estimation. So it is fairly common practice to trim the outliers. So in this study, they trim the top and bottom uh, quarter percentile from, from the data set. And what you see here is um, the coefficients of the three indicator variables are all negative, which is good, which, which says that the treatment has an effect. It reduces water usage. Uh, however, the indicator for treatment one, which is the technical advice, is not statistically significant, whereas that for treatments two and three are both statistically significant. So let's summarize the results for the, active, uh, the average treatment effects. So the results um, is consistent with the hypothesis that moral payoffs influence consumption decisions and that the uh, non-pecuniary costs of an action are increasing in the extent to which the action is scrutinized and or deviates from a perceived social norm. It turns out that, you know, as we've seen from the regression table, the technical advice by itself doesn't have a significant effect, but when it's augmented by an appeal to pro-social preferences or normative messages, it has an effect. And the largest reduction is when you personalize the letter with social comparison information. In other words, how you compare with your neighbors. And what's really interesting about this paper is its analysis of the heterogeneous treatment effects. In other words, we divide people, we divide the entire sample into two groups. Um, the suspicion is that um, the treatments might have different effects on uh, different household types. So they split dat the data into two household types. One type is uh, the low users whose consumption in summer 2006 was less than the median, and the high users are those whose prior usage were above median. And so this is the uh, heterogeneous treatment effects. What you see here is on the horizontal axis, you have the treatments, you know, the technical advice, the weak norm or the um, injunctive norm, and then to the rightmost, you see the strong norm, which is the social comparison condition. So you have a pair of bars for each condition. The dark one are the low users, the below median users, whereas the gray ones are the high users. On the vertical axis, you have the percentage reduction 
in uh, water usage. So what you see here is um, that the technical advice is um, not significant and the effect size is also quite low. But if you look at the weak norm and the strong norm, especially the strong norm, you see that the gray bars are much higher than the, the black bars, which means that the effect on the high users uh, are much stronger than the effects on the, the low users or the be below median users. So this highlights uh, an asymmetry in the effectiveness of conservation programs based on pro-social appeals, um, that the message are most salient among high-use households. This is really good because in the past, we've seen that the high-use households are not price elastic in the sense that, you know, these typically are wealthier households. So if you raise the price of water by 30%, they don't really care, and that doesn't affect how much water they use. Uh, whereas norm-based messages can um, induce a, uh, a significant reduction in their water usage. So in that sense, it is complementary to the price measures or the price-based uh, strategies. What we need to be careful about is um, you know, if, if it's non-pecuniary incentives, maybe the effect will deteriorate over time. So one question, one open question is, you know, how long does the effect last? And, you know, how much decay do we expect in this setting? And the follow-up study is about exactly that. You know, it will answer the question about the decay effect.